Thank you, Scott, for great songs about the Word of God. Thank you, Jarrett, for your reading. Talked about Paul and his preaching the truth and the condemnation of those that err from the truth. They're false apostles, deceitful workers, fashioning themselves into apostles of Christ. And it's no wonder for even Satan fashioned himself into an angel of light. It's no great thing then if his servants set themselves forward as ministers of righteousness. Thank you, Chuck. In the emphasis of the fact that the word of God does not change. Never changes. It's consistent. We can put our weight right down there because it'll never change. Jesus, as Chuck read in Hebrews 13, 8, is the same yesterday, today, yea, and forever. No change in our Lord Jesus. We'll continue our study in 1 Peter. And if we go back and review to catch up, 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That's not Peter, that's Paul talking. That's Ephesians 1, 4. Ephesians 1, 3. 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy begat us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead unto an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who by the power of God are guarded through faith into a salvation ready to appear in the last time. He goes on. Starting in verse 13, he says, Wherefore, because of all that, wherefore, be sober, be obedient, be holy, be reverent, be redeemed, be loving. And when he ends up to be loving, he emphasizes the word of God because all this is possible for our knowing and our understanding by the word of God. He says in verse 22, we're still in 1 Peter 1. Since you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, unto love of the brethren from the heart, fervently love one another. From the heart, fervently, having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which liveth and abideth. All flesh is as grass, and the glory thereof is as the flower of grass, and the flower, uh, excuse me, the grass withers, and the flower falleth, but the word of God abideth forever. And this is the word of the good tidings which was preached unto you. Then he goes into chapter 2 and he continues in the first three verses talking about the word of God the necessity of the word of God he'll go on in 4 to 10 talking about our priesthood but we need to become those that are longing for the spiritual word without guile to make us what we need to be to be priest priest job is to save souls that's our purpose as Christians, the word priest defines the life of a Christian perfectly. So he goes on in chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Putting away, therefore, all wickedness, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, all evil speaking, as newborn babes, Long for the spiritual milk which is without guile, that, the purpose, that you may grow unto salvation if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Putting away, therefore. Notice he uses the word therefore, which shows us that he's not talking about something new. Therefore comes out of what went before. 
Before, he's been talking about the word we got in the new through the word of God, which lives and abides. Therefore, you put away. Putting away. If you look at that word, it has an ing on the pudding, which would mean or indicate that it is a present participle with continuous action. But that's not the case. It's an aorist participle. An aorist participle is action that takes place before the finite verb of the sentence. Does that make sense to you? The aorist participle takes place before, that's action before the verb of the sentence. The verb of the sentence is found in verse 2. Long for. That's an imperative. That's a command. Long for. But before you long for the spiritual milk, which is without guile, you have to put away all your wickedness. Put away. Therefore, having put away, it should be translated, be better, having put away, then you can long for that spiritual milk. Having put away is what takes place in our lives. That's the pivotal point in the lives. That's the point where we come into all the joy of being a Christian, the joy of having that eternal life, being begotten anew that we've been talking about. Great joy comes. That's the burning point. But you have to get rid of the old man. Remember Ephesians 4. If you start in verse 17... He talks about not being like the Gentiles in all their wickedness. And he gets down to verse 20, he says, But you did not so learn in Christ, if you heard him and were taught in him, for truth is in Christ, that you put away, there's our word, that you put away is concerning your former manner of life, the old man that waxes growth after the deceit of lust, be renewed. Now that's the longing for the spiritual milk. Being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man. That after God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. That's that changing point. In Colossians 3, which we often speak of. He says in verses 1 to 4. If you're raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. For Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not the things that are upon the earth. He says in 5 to 7, put away therefore your members which are upon the earth. No, put to death therefore. In 8 to 10 he says, putting off therefore anger, wrath, malice, railing, shameful speaking out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you have put off the old man with his doings. And have put on the new man that's being renewed unto knowledge after the image of him who created him. That's the turning point. Put away all wickedness. Long for the spiritual milk, which is without guile. That changing point took place at baptism. Paul emphasizing the necessity of righteousness in the Christian. In Romans 6, he says in verse 3, Are you ignorant that as many as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? You were buried therefore with him through baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so also we should walk a newness of life. It's a new life. The old man, the putting away that Peter talks about, is taking that old man and burying him. Leave him in the grave. The one that comes up is a new man that is longing for the spiritual milk. In Galatians 3, he tells us, verse 26, we're all sons of God through faith. For, as many as we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into Christ. We're clothed with Christ. We're in Christ. It is only in Christ that salvation exists. 
Nothing outside of Christ can be saved because he is our salvation as Chuck emphasized when he talked about the Lord's Supper. Jesus did all that dying so we can live. The only life is in Jesus. The Bible tells you how you get in Jesus. You get in Jesus by Romans 6 and Galatians 3 by being baptized into Jesus. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father but by me. Those are in John. That putting away took place at baptism. In 1 Peter 3, in verse 20, he's talking about Noah. And he says, eight souls were saved by water. 21 says, and in true likeness also doth now save you even baptism. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the interrogation of good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the putting away. You put away all wickedness. Notice these terms have all in front of them. So uh, Peter doesn't reiterate what he's talking about. If you read Romans 1, in verse, uh, verses 18 and following, he's talking about God's wrath on sin. He talks about he gives them up to uh, the lust of their hearts, to the depravity of them. And to a reprobate mind. And when he talks about the reprobate mind. If you look in Romans 1. 29 down through 31. I'll read that. He reiterates the all wickedness that, Paul, that Peter's talking about. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, whispers. Backbiters, hateful to God, insolent, haughty, boastful. Inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, unmerciful. Paul reiterates, Peter just says, all wickedness and all guile. If you notice, the guile there speaks of the de decoy. The word that is translated guile there originally spoke of the bait that you put in a trap. You put a trap out here to trap something or to kill something. But to deceive the animal or whatever it is, you put something that he wants on there. That's the bait. That's the guile that's spoken of here. And when he comes up there, he thinks he's getting something that gives him life and it kills him. You put away all that deceit. Hypocrisy. Envy. Evil speaking. Hypocrisy is an action that you act something that you're not. Originally, the word spoke of an actor in the, in, the, in, the, in the plays that they had way back in the times of the Grecians. He's acting a part that that's not him. He's acting a part. That's hypocrisy. First Peter, excuse me, Timothy 4. Verse 1 says, the Spirit says especially in the latter times, some shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons through the hypocrisy of men speaking lies. That's what Jarrett wrote, read in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen to 15. The hypocrisy of men setting themselves forward as apostles. They're false apostles, false workers. Deceitful people. They're servants of Satan. Put them away. He says in, uh, Jesus says, even so you also, or Matthew 23, where he's talking about the scribes, the Pharisees, the hypocrites. He says in verse 28 of chapter 23, he says, even so you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but inwardly are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The word all evil speaking is backbiting. It's only used here in one other verse, and that's 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 12, 20, where the ASV translates it backbiting. 
as newborn babes, long for the spiritual milk, which is without guile, that you may grow unto salvation. Newborn. Talking about those who are just born. Newborn children, babies in Christ. Huh. That kind of did a work on that, didn't it? That's because I changed it from Mac to the other system, and it doesn't always work. Newborn. He's talking about babies that are just born. How did they get born? Well, back where we started in 1 Peter 1, 3. According to his great mercy, he begat us anew into a living hope. That is through the word of God, he says in verse 23. Through the word of God, which is living and active, you're begotten again. That took place then. He says, now you long for. That's the verb of the sentence right there. You long for, and that's an imperative, that's a command, it's not a suggestion. You long for, means intensely desiring to receive something. Jesus says in Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, verse 6, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirsting. He's not talking about when we get through here or before I get through, you're going to say, I want to go eat. You're not hungry. We use that word, I'm hungry. We're not hungry, we have an appetite. You might get hungry if you haven't eaten for two or three days. Actually, we think we're hungry because our mind tells us that. It's not our body. Our mind says, this time we eat, so I'm hungry. Jesus is not talking about that type of hunger. He's talking about hunger. If I don't get food, I die. And thirsting, thirsting after righteousness. We have in this auditorium a multitude of hunters. And you all have been out there in the field. And it's hot and it's dry. And all of a sudden we're out of water. And you can get thirsty. You have to have water to live. That's what Jesus is talking about. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you shall be filled. That's a promise of God. He's going to fill you. You long for the spiritual milk which was without gal. That is, but it's as babes that we long for milk. Babies need milk. The only thing babies need is milk. And it's the whole food for a baby for them to grow. Then he says, the spiritual milk which is without gout. Now I'm sorry, as I always say, this thing dumped out the whole thing rather than doing it a line at a time like it's supposed to do. Because I wanted to talk about this. The spiritual milk without gout. The word spiritual comes from the word, <laughs> taking all the Greek words and made them little bitty things, huh? Logikos, translated spiritual. It's only used here and in Romans 12, 1, passage we all know well. I beseech you by the mercy of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable in God, which is your reasonable service, some say. Some say your spiritual service or spiritual worship. But the word here is an adjective. Now, as you see up there, the King James and the New American Standard, I'm sorry the New American Standard did that. It usually translates well. Translates it the word. It translates the pure milk of the word. But it is an adjective. It's not a noun. Of the word is a prepositional phrase and makes the word a noun. It's not a noun, it's an adjective. An adjective modifies the noun. The noun that it modifies is milk, gala. Along with the word without guile. Both of those are adjectives modifying. If you look up there at the top, 
Thereafter, the spiritual milk without guile. If you look at that, it says, the spiritual without guile milk is what the original language says. Those are adjectives modifying milk. They're not nouns. The King James and New American Standard translates this as a noun. That's not a good translation. The American Standard and the ESV translates it, the spiritual milk which was without guile. Or the ESV translates the pure. Without guile it puts before the spiritual, the pure spiritual milk. Without guile. If you notice the word without guile is the same thing as when it says up there in verse 1, put away therefore all wickedness, all guile. It's the same word as guile there, except it's got an alpha in front of it, which means it's the opposite of that type of thing. It's that which is pure and holy. And all this is modifying the milk that grows us unto salvation. I'd like to look at something that W.E. Vine said. He wrote the expository dictionary of the New Testament Greek words. He says, speaking of of milk there, first off, milk is used in the the New Testament. That's just milk. Such as in 1 Corinthians 9, 7, he that feedeth the flock does also drink of the milk of the flock. But it's used often as a as metaphorically, which speaks of the rudimentary spiritual teaching. Now listen to what Vine had to say about this milk. We'll read that. Here the meaning largely depends upon the significance of the word word logikos. That's the one translated spiritual. He'll tell you what it means here. Which the authorized version renders of the word. The revised version, spiritual. While logos denotes a word, the adjective, logos is the root word of the word logikos, but the word logikos is an adjective, not a noun, like logos is. While logos denotes a word, the adjective logikos is never used with a meaning assigned to it by the the authorized version. Nor does the content, context of 123, that's the one that says, being Begotten anew, not by corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which liveth and active. He says, nor does the context of 123 compel this meaning. While it is true that the word of God, like milk, nurses the soul, and this is involved in the exhortation, the only other occurrence in the New Testament is Romans 12, 1, which I mentioned a while ago, where it's translated reasonable. Meaning, rational, intelligent service in contrast to the offering of an irrational animal. So here, 1 Peter 1 here, 1 Peter 2, excuse me. So here, the nourishment may be understood as that spiritually rational nature which acting through the regenerate mind, the newborn babe, develops spiritual growth. God's word is not given so that it's impossible to understand it or that it requires a special class of men to interpret it. Its character is such that the Holy Spirit who gave it can unfold its truth even to the young convert. So we all as newborn babes, the Holy Spirit gives his word so that the new convert can understand it. We need to be reading and understanding that word. He says here in 1 Peter 2, 2, the same thing that James 1, 21 says. James says, Wherefore, putting away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Both of them tells you it's the word of God that saves your souls that you may grow thereby. This is the growth that Paul expected in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 3, 3. Paul will mention three types of men, a natural man, a spiritual man, and a carnal man. He says in chapter 2, verse 14, Now, the natural man 
cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He cannot know them for they're spiritually judged. Verse 15, he says, the spiritual man judges all things. Then he says in chapter 3, verse 1, When I came, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with meat, for you're not able to bear it. Nay, even now you're not able. For you're yet carnal. For if among you there is jealousy and strife, are you not carnal? And do you not walk after the manner of men? The people forgot to grow. In verse 1, he says, When I came, when I and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but unto carnal. Now, the, the word carnal in the original language speaks of the flesh. It's your, your fleshly. But the ending of the word in verse 1 speaks of the material of which you're made up of. He couldn't speak to them as spiritual. When he came to them, they didn't know God. They didn't know anything. He had to speak to them as babes in Christ. There was nothing wrong with them being babes in Christ. But as we see in 1 Peter, babes in Christ are to long for the spiritual milk that they may be growing to salvation. So when they, when he says in verse 1, you were carnal, that's talking about the material you're made up, you're fleshly. You hadn't grown spiritually. So he said, I fed you with milk and not with meat. There was nothing wrong with that at that time. He says, because you were not able to bear it. But the end of verse 2 makes a change. Nay, even now you're not able. Now he's criticizing them because they didn't grow. For you're yet carnal. Now in verse 3, the ending of the word in verse 3 speaks of their character, not what they're made up of. Verse 1, they were made up of flesh, which we're all made up of flesh. Verse 3 says, your character, your characteristic, your nature is fleshly. It's not spiritually. You should have grown spiritually, but you didn't grow spiritually. He's criticizing them. He wanted them to grow spiritually. But the big problem with this is, although they're not natural men, they act like natural men. You walk as men, like natural men. So we have people that are Christians. They name the name of Jesus. They're not natural men because they accept the word of God, but they never grow. And the problem is, in their not growth, they act like men around them. So people think they're people like natural men that don't know spiritual things. When we go out amongst the people of this world and we talk like the world, we use language like the world, we walk after the manner of the natural man. When we dress like the world, when we act like the world, we're carnal, we're refusing to grow. That's what Paul is telling these people. Growth is a natural result of healthy people. Anything that has life, People, animals, fish, birds, plants, whatever it is. If it has life, it's expected to grow. And it's a shame. It's a shame that in the church there are many that are crippled. Name the name of Jesus 20 years ago. And still a two-year-old, spiritually. No growth. That's what Paul is saying to the Corinthian Brethren, the soul that feeds on the word of God cannot help but grow. It's an impossibility. You can't feed on God's word and not grow spiritually. If you're not growing spiritually, guess what the problem is? We're not in God's word. The writer of the Hebrew letter had the same problem. 
In Hebrews 5, verse 10, he mentions Melchizedek. Christ is a high priest after the manner of Melchizedek, verse 11, of whom we have much to say, but hard of interpretation because you've become dull of hearing. They didn't originally, they weren't originally, excuse me, they weren't originally dull of hearing. They received the word of God, but when they become Christians, they became babes. They stayed babes. Why? They become dull of hearing. People that stand up here and preach and teach. You look out of an audience and you see many lies, eyes are light and they're listening. They want to know and many of them just like a stump back there. They become dull of hearing. For when by means of time they should have become teachers. They have need again that someone teach them the rudiments of the first principles of the oracles of God and have become babes. It's not what they were. They become babes and have need of milk and not solid food. For everyone that partakes of milk is without experience in the word of righteousness because they're babes. Solid food is for full grown men who by reason of use have their senses exercised that they can determine or discern between good and evil. The church is what our Lord Jesus gave eternal life to. By a sacrifice, he gave up his life so we can live. And we're often so I don't know what the English word there, chui, chui, that's Thai, which means just, just whatever. We come to the assembly, but that's as far as it goes. There's no burning in the heart to know the word of God. Scripture continually What's up? I've got that somewhere. Scripture continually emphasizes the importance of reading and studying God's Word. It emphasizes it over and over and over again. Reading. Every one of us, listen, every one of us, whether you're young or old, every one of us needs a quiet time daily that we spend our time with the Lord. And don't tell me you don't have time because one day you're going to have time to die. And you always have time to do what you think is important. Always. The most important thing you can do is have a quiet time with you and the Lord. You talk to the Lord when you pray to Him. The Lord talks to you when you read His Word. Read. When you received a love letter from your lover, you didn't try to dissect that thing. You read it. You read this letter. Now, once you read it, you may go back and analyze some of the things that were said. That would be study. You need to do both, but they're two different things. Spend time reading. Read God's Word daily. We need to spend our time in God's Word. Do we watch TV more than we read God's Word? Do you spend more time reading a fiction novel than you do God's Word? And I'm not against reading the novel. I'm against an unbalanced reading of things. What's important in your life. This is the only book. The Bible is the only book. That gives the knowledge of eternal life. No other book out there gives knowledge of eternal life. We spend years and years in schooling. From kindergarten to getting out of college or universities, usually by the time you're 25, you'll spend 20 years, hours and hours, 
thousands of dollars spent preparing yourself for what? Maybe 50 years of productivity if you, if you retire or die at 75? All those thousands of hours, all those thousands of dollars to prepare yourself for about 50 years of living. And then it's gone. If you compare that to eternal life, not a 50 years of living well, we're talking about eternal life. Now, eternity doesn't have time. But if it did have time, you're comparing 50 years with millions and millions and millions and millions of years. And we spend all that time preparing for a few years in life. And we're just chay chay, what I mentioned before, I don't know what it is in English. About studying in the Word of God? Something's wrong with our thinking. When God tells you, our Lord Jesus tells you, where it's there somewhere, one thing is necessary. Jesus goes into the house of Martha. Mary sits at his feet and listens to his word. Martha's come with much serving, comes to Jesus and says, Don't you care that my sister left me to serve alone? Bid her to help me. Jesus says, Martha, you're cumbered and worried about many things, but one thing is needful. Mary's chosen the good part. Martha's concerned with pots and pans. She's concerned with physical food. Mary's concerned with eternal food. Jesus said, one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the good part. I'd like for us to listen to some psalms and other passages that show us the importance of the Word of God. If you look at Psalms 1, he says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth not in the way of sinners, nor sitteth not in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Jehovah, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the streams of water that beareth fruit in its season, whose leaf also does not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The wicked are not so, for it is the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand in the judgment or sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for Jehovah knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Psalms 19, we all know verse 1, don't we? The heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the firmament is handiwork. But verse 7 says, The law of Jehovah, the law of Jehovah is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of Jehovah is sure, giving wise to the simple, giving wisdom to the simple. The precepts of Jehovah are right. And rejoicing the heart. The commandments of Jehovah are pure. Enlightening the eyes. The fear of Jehovah endureth forever. The ordinances of Jehovah are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey, and the droppings of the honeycomb. For by them... Your servant is warned, and in keeping them, there's great reward. The Word of God. Get in the Word of God and bury yourselves right there. If you had the time, 119, Psalms 119, it's only got 176 verses. But the whole Psalms, praises the word and the glory of the word of God. He says in verse 6, Then shall I not be put to shame when I have regard unto thy commandments. He says in verse 9, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way by giving reward thereto according to the word of God. 
Verse 11 says, Thy word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against him. If you jump clear down to about verse 97, he says, Oh, how I love thy word is my meditation all the day. Thy commandments make me wiser than my enemies because they're always with me. I have more understanding than my teachers because thy testimony is my meditation. I understand more than the aged because I keep thy precepts. He goes on down in 104 says, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every evil way. We already talked about the necessity of hatred of evil. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It's all the word of God. It is the word of God. Remember chapter 1 verse 23. I've mentioned several times, having been got, begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abideth. It's living and abiding. In Colossians 1, listen to the necessity of the knowledge of the word of God. In verse 9, Paul says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray and make requests for you that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and to all spiritual wisdom and understanding, to walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in your knowledge of God. Listen to what Peter says about knowledge in 2 Peter 1, verse 2. Grace to you and peace abound in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus. Seeing that his divine power has granted unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through a knowledge. That's the second time. Through a knowledge of him who called you after his own glory and virtue. Whereby he's granted unto you his divine nature having escaped the corruption of the world through lust. Yea and for this very cause giving all diligence. Add to your faith virtue to your virtue, knowledge. To your knowledge, self-control. Where's your self-control? Patience, your patience, godliness, your godliness, brotherly kindness, your brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are in you and abound, they make you not to be idle or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he that lacks these is blind, seeing only the things that are near, having forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. Therefore, brethren, give the more diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never stumble, and thus shall be richly supplied unto you the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That. Long for the spiritual milk which thou got. That. So that. You may grow unto salvation it's unto salvation the word unto there is the preposition in the original language which means into you grow into salvation that tells you a relationship between our growth and our salvation verse 3 if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious now in Hebrews 6 he talks about tasting also he says it's touching those that as once enlightened have tasted the heavenly gift and been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come. Then he goes ahead and talks about them falling away. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the tasting of the heavenly gift. The tasting of the good word of God. It's the, heaven, the heavenly gift comes through the good word of God. That's again what we said in chapter 123, which we've mentioned several times. You're begotten again through the word of God, which abideth and liveth. Because all flesh is as grass, and the glory thereof is of the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falleth. But the word of God abideth forever. 
And this is the word of good tidings which was preached unto you. If you have tasted. That is in the indicative. Which means that is real. It's not asking a question. He knows you've tasted of the good word of God. You could translate that according to the original language, since you have tasted in the word, uh, and since you have tasted the Lord is gracious. That should put a zeal and a burning of our heart to be just like our Lord for everything he did for us. And the only way we can know the Lord is through the word of God. We need to get in the word of God and bury ourselves in the word of God. We need to be so thankful that nothing could stop us from seeking everything in the word of God that makes us like Jesus. Verse 3 came out of Psalms 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that Jehovah is good. Blessed are they that take their refuge in him. Where are we taking our refuge? In our physical life, which is temporary? Or are we taking our refuge in Jesus and living eternally? We're not here long. Eternity never ends. It is forever. Remember, Jesus said, one thing is needful. All this other stuff around us is peripheral stuff. One thing is needful. Be right with Christ. Jesus says, go ye into all the world, make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's putting off all wickedness and all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. Verse 20 says, teaching them, those that were baptized, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have told you, though I am with you always into the end of the earth. That is longing for the spiritual meal wherein you may grow. The Great Commission covers both sides getting rid of the old man and burying him, being born a new life. Now that life is to long for the spiritual milk that they may grow unto salvation. If you not come to Christ, you desperately need to heed the first verse I read. That's in Matthew 28, 19. Be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then seek that pure milk. If you have named the name of Christ and become dull of Harry and need to reinsert yourself into serving Christ, whatever your need, come forward this morning. We're going to sing a song and you can come forward and make your needs known.